Welcome to another episode of Tell Me Another, a podcast dedicated to telling great stories from the past. Stories of genius and folly, compassion and cruelty. Instead of sitting around a campfire telling stories of our ancestors, we're coming to you from the History Department of the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. We're coming with stories to tell and we hope you will listen. With us in the studio today are Commander Ryan Mewitt, Associate Professor Wayne Shea, and Lieutenant Commander Retired Dwight Hughes, who we're happy to say is of the uh, Naval Academy class of 1967, who served in the River Forces in Vietnam, and is the recipient of both a Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. And also the author, most recently, this is his third book, Unlike Anything That Ever Floated, The USS Monitor and the Battle of Hampton Roads. So Dwight will be narrating for us today the remarkable story of the Battle of Hampton Roads. Dwight? Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be back at Navy and to talk about the uh, Battle of Hampton Roads. It was Saturday, March 8, 1862. The USS Monitor steamed into Chesapeake Bay. After rushing down from New York through the gale force winds, almost sinking in the process. Monitor's mission was to stop the Confederate ironclad ram, the CSS Virginia, from destroying the wooden warships of the Union fleet in Hampton Roads. The captain ordered an exhausted and dispirited crew to strip the vessel of her sea rig and make all preparations for battle. Monitor was a steam-propelled, iron-plated raft, 172 feet long with a 42-foot beam and 8-foot draft. The flat expanse of deck was barely a foot and a half above the surface. A cylindrical iron turret, 20 feet in diameter and 9 feet tall, squatted in the middle of the deck, containing two 11-inch Dahlgren guns. Fourteen officers and 57 crewmen were encased in the hull below the waterline. To mid-19th century mariners, this enclosed, cramped artificial space, which resembled future submarines, was a radical departure from sailing and fighting on the open decks and in the high rigging of a traditional man of war, and not a little intimidating. Monitor redefined the relationship between men and machines in war, challenging ancient concepts of honor and valor. William Keeler, the ship's paymaster, wrote to his wife, You may rest assured your better half will be in no more danger from rebel compliments than if he was seated with you at home. There isn't danger enough to give us any glory. Not a man is exposed in action, Our boilers and our entire machinery are completely protected. In the latter 19th century, Monitor would become a cultural icon of American industrial strength and ingenuity in advertisements for everything from whiskey to refrigerators. She embodied social and institutional as well as industrial revolutions. But this would be a symbolic role which would outshine her accomplishments beyond a single engagement in a specific set of circumstances. After the Battle of Hampton Roads, the the Union caught monitor fever. Fifty monitors would be built in a bewildering range of one, two, and three turret classes. But as a warship type, they were of limited utility. With a low profile, monitors were not seagoing vessels and were not effective against shore fortifications, although they did neutralize several Confederate ironclads. The most important technical innovation was the rotating armored turret, which would evolve into 20th century battleships. But during monitors' construction, public opinion had been decidedly ambivalent concerning this strange watercraft. This generation had witnessed a breathtaking technological transition from timeless horse-drawn transportation to huge puffing iron locomotives. While on the water, tall warships always inspired all. 
but so far they look much the same even when driven by steam as well as sail. It was not clear to the public where Little Monitor fit in this revolution. Was she even a ship, or just a small, ironclad, two-gun battery? Many could not conceive that a slab of iron would even float. One Vermont reporter could hardly find words to describe the thing. She is, in fact, unlike anything that ever floated on Neptune's bosom, he wrote. Viewed from a distance, Monitor looked insignificant and harmless. But standing upon his deck, she appeared powerful and invulnerable. This sea monster resembled the Leviathan of the Scriptures. The vessel had a most singular appearance, wrote one officer. From a half-mile distant, she appeared to be sinking. The hull was not even visible while the turret sat upon the water by itself. People said she looked like a wash tub on a raft, a cheese box on a plank, a hat on a shingle, etc., etc. Poet Nathaniel Hawthorne would comment, it looked like a gigantic rat trap. It was ugly and suspicious. Nay, I will allow myself to call it devilish. Monitor's commanding officer, Lieutenant John L. Warden, recalled, here was an unknown, untried vessel with all but a small portion below the waterline. Her crew to live with the ocean beating over their heads. An iron coffin-like ship of which the gloomiest predictions were made with her crew shut out from sunlight and from the air above the sea, depending entirely on artificial means to supply the air they breathe. A failure of the machinery would be almost certain death to her men. As Monitor proceeded across Chesapeake Bay that afternoon, they heard heavy guns in the distance. Plumes of smoke hung over the land. Little black spots sprang into the air, paused for a moment, and expanded into large white clouds. Gun flashes lit the darkening horizon. Bursting shells flashed in the air. The harbor pilot boarded and informed them that the dreaded Virginia was raking havoc in Hampton Roads. The sailing sloop of war USS Cumberland was sunk. The sailing frigate USS Congress was ablaze. Vessels were fleeing like a covey of frightened quails. Their lights danced over the water in all directions. The steam frigate USS Minnesota, the most powerful ship the Navy could deploy, had run hard aground off Newport News Point earlier in the day while pursuing the marauding Virginia. The rebel ironclad Shirley would return in the morning to destroy the frigate. Captain Warden was ordered to defend her. He cleared for action and anchored near Minnesota. Executive Officer Lieutenant Samuel Green recalled, an atmosphere of gloom pervaded the fleet. The pygmy aspect of the newcomer did not inspire confidence among those who had witnessed the destruction of the day before. The Congress still blazed like a gigantic torch stuck in the mud where she had been pulverized by Virginia. Around 2 a.m. that morning, she blew up. Certainly a grander sight was never seen, wrote Lieutenant Green, but it went straight to the marrow of our bones. Near us, too, at the bottom of the river, lay the Cumberland with her silent crew of brave men who died while fighting their guns to the water's edge. Thank you, Dwight. It's uh, obvious that the monitor did not come from nowhere. Can you tell us about the technological developments that drove ironclad design and the progress that European nations had made in incorporating these technologies into ships prior to 1861? Uh, surely. Um, there was a, a, a frantic ironclad arms race going on in Europe, uh, primarily between Great Britain and France. Uh, they developed the first seagoing ironclads, the, the French 
developed the Galois in November 1859, and then the Br British produced the magnificent HMS Warrior in 1860. She's now a museum ship in Portsmouth, England, the first warship with a wholly iron structure and the most powerful and most advanced in the world. Uh, it's commonly thought that the Monitor uh, was uh, the ironclad program of the U.S. Navy uh, was developed at war's beginning to, to primarily to fight the Confederates. Well, that was not initially true. Uh, actually, the, their primary concern was the British. Um, the administration was very concerned that the British would intervene in the conflict, and the U.S. Navy had no ironclads. They had developed uh, magnificent wooden steam cruisers like the Merrimack Frigate class, uh, of which the Minnesota was a sister ship. And the Merrimack, of course, would be would be provide the hull and engineering plant for the CSS Virginia. But the U.S. Navy had had no reason to develop ironclads before the war. Uh, but when the war started and they're concerned about the British, uh, they decided they better do that. Um, so they began the, the, uh, the U.S. Navy's ironclad building program uh, and um, developed uh, two, two vessels to begin with, the USS New Ironsides and the USS Galena, which were traditional warships with iron cladding. And the uh, the monitor was uh, was uh, considered strictly an experiment, and it was hoped that she would counter the Virginia. But uh, senior naval officers were not entirely confident of that. In the summer of 1861, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells struggled with the notion of ironclad vessels. It was a subject full of difficulty and doubt, he told Congress. England and France had built large, powerful seagoing ironclads. The United States had none. It was evident, he continued, that a new and material element in maritime warfare was developing itself and demanded immediate attention. Senator James Grimes supported the construction of ironclads, we need a more effective blockade, he declared on the floor of the Senate. Scoundrels north as well as scoundrels south are carrying on an unlawful trade in fraud of our revenue. Pirates and sea rovers must be captured. Southern harbors and forts must be retaken. Commerce must be protected and northern harbors defended. Suppose England, in her love for cotton, should attempt to break the blockade, and we should get into trouble with her. What is to become of our northern cities and our cities upon the coast? But the most immediate threats were the Confederate ironclads under construction in Norfolk, Mobile, and New Orleans, particularly the former USS Merrimack, rapidly becoming the CSS Virginia. The Mobile Register boasted that this new weapon would be a floating fortress that would be able to defeat the whole Navy of the United States and bombard its cities. With their great size, strength, powerful engines, and invulnerable iron casing, she would easily destroy or disperse the blockading fleet. She could throw bombs into Fort Monroe. We hope soon to hear that she is ready to commence her avenging career upon the seas. Northern public opinion was aroused also. The Philadelphia Examiner thought it curious that the United States should be so behind the age. If we intend to have a national naval force worthy of our power and pretensions, we shall have to build iron case vessels as France and England have done and are doing. But Secretary Wells was overseeing an immense unprecedented warship procurement and building program while instigating a nearly impossible continent-wide blockade. Without further study, he concluded, it would not be advisable to commit heavy expenditures by way of experiment on unproven technology. 
So Congress directed Secretary Wells to appoint an ironclad board to investigate plans and specifications for constructing iron or steel-clad steamships or steam batteries, appropriating for that purpose one and a half million dollars. He selected three senior line officers, two Commodores, who were veterans of the War of 1812, crusty old salts of the wood and canvas Navy, and one commander. The board advertised for proposals and from them recommended three designs. To confront the European threat, the first two designs were conventional wooden hulls with iron cladding, broadside battery, auxiliary steam engines, and full sailing rig. They would become the USS New Ironsides and the USS Galena. The final board selection, as proposed by Swedish engineer John Ericsson, was a shot in the dark. Commander Hughes, first of all, I want to thank you uh, again for coming uh, to, to speak with us and sharing your research. I also wanted to uh, remind our listeners that uh, this narrative is drawn from a fantastic book uh, called Unlike Anything That Ever Floated the Mon Monitor in Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. Uh, it's part of the Emerging Civil War series uh, that's been published by Savas Beattie. So, Commander Hughes, I, I just wanted to maybe ask you to maybe put in context uh, some of the importance of the battle, especially with regards to uh, Union sort of uh, Army-Navy joint operations, which I think sometimes is maybe not talked about as much as it should be with regards to McClellan. Uh, I think um, those familiar, even passingly with the Civil War, know a lot about the riverine, uh, the brown water operations, and that's obviously close to your own experience in Vietnam to some degree. Uh, but could you just uh, discuss how, how we might situate uh, the battle in the context of uh, the Union's need to maintain its control of the sea and why that's uh, the various ways that was important to, to eventual federal success. Uh, yes, well, the Battle of Hampton Roads was uh, an important element in the Peninsula Command, uh, Campaign of, of uh, General McClellan. At the time the battle took place in uh, uh, early April, 1862, uh, the or early March 1862, um, he was planning his uh, his invasion of the peninsula, and he had planned upon and counted upon uh, seaborne uh, transportation, uh, seaborne supply of, of ammunition and supplies, and uh, being able to move his troops along the York and and James Rivers on on the flanks of the peninsula. The presence of the CSS Virginia severely hampered his plans in that respect and, and probably uh, enhanced his innate tendency for precaution, uh, shall we say. After the battle, the Navy did support him uh, in the Battle of Malvern Hills with, uh, with shore bombardment and also uh, extracted his army from the peninsula. So the, the, the battle itself and the, the, the Navy would become a, a critical part of, of combined operations uh, uh, throughout the war. Inventor and engineer John Ericsson was born in 1803. He had a long career in Sweden, England, and America designing, building, and improving steam engines. He produced a host of inventions, including the shipboard steam condenser, and collected numerous patents. Ericsson's ironclad proposal to the ironclad board, recalled Secretary Wells, contained extraordinary and valuable features for coast and river blockade. It involved a revolution in naval warfare. President Lincoln remarked of Erickson's design for the monitor, all I have to say is what the girl said when she put her foot into the stocking. It strikes me there's something in it. Erickson's low-profile concept was inspired by Swedish lumber rafts, and with the heavy armored turret on deck, driven by the need for a low center of gravity to maintain stability. He never claimed to have invented the revolving armored turret. The idea had been circulating among engineers for decades. 
but he was the first to successfully deploy it. The ironclad board, however, had serious reservations about the Monitor's design and reluctantly agreed to proceed. Their critical requirement was a combat-ready craft suitable for restricted waters to be rapidly constructed and deployed against the expected launch of the Virginia in Hampton Roads. In Monitor's favor were presumed invulnerability, small size, shallow draft, and a limited target area. But there were also worrisome unknowns, including over-reliance on steam power, she had no sails, a semi-submerged hull, questionable stability, and the untried turret-mounted armament. Monitor also was unseaworthy and an uncomfortable and cramped environment to operate guns and steam machinery. The contract was signed on October 4, 1861, for an ironclad, shot-proof steam battery. John Erickson and his backers were to deliver the vessel complete and ready for service within the unprecedented span of 100 days for a price of $275,000. Erickson began a frantic and incredibly complex manufacturing process using civilian facilities because Navy shipyards had no capabilities to produce ironclads. He orchestrated an unprecedented conglomerate of nine contractors and multiple subcontractors working simultaneous, simultaneously in at least seven northeast cities to produce raw materials, angle iron, bar iron, plate iron, and rivets, and then assembled them into finished components, which were then assembled at the Continental Iron Works in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Most of these firms clustered around New York City and Albany, centers of steam engine and iron manufacturing. They applied methods and materials in common use for locomotives and other civilian machinery. Only Yankees could produce an experimental ironclad vessel from scratch in 100 days. Despite the rush, Erickson did not scrimp on furnishings and gadgets. The officers' closet-sized staterooms were appointed in Victorian opulence from the inventor's own pocket, while the crewmen slept in hammocks on the more utilitarian berth deck. Six-inch round glass windows or deck lights set in the deck overhead, supplemented by oil lamps, provided meager illumination in the deck below. Erickson crafted a compact 400-horsepower steam engine with a single cylinder, 40 inches in diameter, driving two horizontal pistons. Auxiliary steam engines, an uncommon feature at the time, drove the turret revolution and the ventilation blowers. A steam condenser provided fresh water. The guns were mounted in customized, low-profile friction carriages to dampen recoil in the confined turret. Erickson also installed the first custom-designed pressure flushing below the waterline water closets, or heads, when the ship's surgeon failed to operate the flushing valves in the correct order, he suffered the indignity of being blown off the seat by a jet of water. To command monitor, Gideon Wells selected 27-year veteran Lieutenant John L. Warden. Warden had been captured by Confederates the previous year while running secret dispatches to Fort Pickens in Florida becoming the conflict's first prisoner of war. Confined in Alabama for eight months before being exchanged, Warden was still ill and weak when he assumed command. Lieutenant Samuel Dana Green was named executive officer, second in command. The 22-year-old Marylander graduated from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis in June 1859. Green represented the young professional officer corps, educated at the new school, steeped in the new technologies, 
and fired in the crucible of war to lead the Navy into the 20th century. On the drizzly morning of January 30th, 1862, monitors slid down the ways into the East River before a large, spontaneous crowd. The New York Tribune wrote, The assemblage cheered rapturously as the strange-looking craft glided swiftly and gracefully into its new element. Nearby vessels fired salutes. Predictions that she would break her back or swamp upon launching were disproven. But the CSS Virginia was expected to appear in Hampton Roads any day, so work continued around the clock to complete fitting out. Despite futile attempts at secrecy, journalists swarmed the ship, leaving in their reporting little to the imagination for friend or foe. For crewmen, Warden sought volunteers from warships in New York Harbor. He described to them the probable perils of passage and the certainty of combat. Many more enthusiastically responded than were required. A better crew no naval commander ever had the honor to command, he would write. But few of these men had pre-war sea service. Most were recent recruits with little or no maritime experience. Some were European immigrants, and at least two were African Americans. The volunteers endured ribbing from their fellow seamen. In a solemn and prophetic tone, one old salt proclaimed, You fellows certainly have got a lot of nerve, or want to commit suicide, one or the other. Several of the volunteers took one look at Monitor and promptly deserted. But after hurried and superficial testing, Monitor got underway for Hampton Roads on March 6, 1862. So, Commander Hughes, I'd like you to maybe talk a little bit about um, the, the multi-ethnic and multi-racial nature of, of the Union Navy's crews uh, during this time, which is a, a, not all the listeners may know this, but is a striking contrast. So even after African-American troops are inducted into the Union Army, they are in segregated units with white officers. Uh, but in the case of the Navy, there is a long uh, prior maritime tradition that, that leads to a very different um, uh, composition of, of these ships' crews. And also, I'd just like to let also our listeners know that this will also be a way uh, – for Commander Hughes to preview, he has a book coming out this winter called The Civil War on the Water, Favorite Stories and Fresh Perspectives from the Historians at the Emerging Civil War, where you can also will, will soon be able to find out more information about such topics. Sailors were not like soldiers. They, they, they lived in a different world, as, as, as we do now. <laughs> but there was no professional naval enlisted service at the time. The Navy always had difficulty recruiting right from, right from its beginning and didn't always get the best candidates. But the Navy also had also been racially and ethnically diverse. The Navy officers are always desperate for men, and they're, they're happy to take them from wherever they can get them. Race and skin color just didn't have the importance that it did on land, because the Navy was its own environment with its own tradition stretching back centuries. Uh, it was a rigid class system, but based... Um, primarily on social class, but but also on rank, abilities, and, and performance. Twenty-three percent of, of sailors in the in the Civil War were African American. About eighteen thousand men and eleven women are known to have served uh, African American men and women. Um, most sailors were from the poor and working classes of of northern and European cities. Uh, they represented the urban industrial class, uh, even at a time when America was still 80% rural. They enlisted primarily for individual rather than collective reasons. Uh, the, they did not generally aspire to, to gentlemanly virtues or sacrificial aspirations or ideological motivations. Uh, their war was one of routine and boredom uh, and isolation with, a, with, uh, with few battles. Uh, but when they did have to fight, they could, they could fight like demons, and they took pride in their ship uh, and in their crewmates and were a proud part of, of the conflict.
This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History, and our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.